Thank you for joining us for this special edition of BCW 21 News. I'm joined now with Monica Hatchett of Henry County Public Schools. And since school has started, we, um, we're trying to get an update on how things are going. One of the biggest questions and questions that come along with you all starting school is how does hybrid learning work? So can you explain to those individuals before we get into our discussion what that is? Well, like a lot of school divisions around the state, we are offering a hybrid learning model for our students and families. Um, as public education goes, we want students to have the option to participate in classes as is most appropriate for them. So our families started school virtually back in August and beginning October 12th, we had the opportunity to offer in-person learning for students who prefer that model. So certainly it is a family's choice, but currently our hybrid model is that all students grades pre-K through 12 have the option, if they prefer, to attend school on the A-B model. So for us, that means A days are Monday and Tuesday, B days are Wednesday and Thursday, and then everyone learns virtually from home on Friday. So for example, if a student chooses to be an in-person learner for part of that time on the hybrid model, if you're an A-day student, you come to school Monday, Tuesday, learn from home Wednesday through Friday. Meals are served at school on the days you're there in person. And then as a virtual learner, whether you're full-time virtual or just virtual for part of the week, you have the opportunity to pick up meals at school. So we are still feeding students five days a week, breakfast and lunch. And um, so that way families have the opportunity to choose their educational platform. If virtual maybe just wasn't working well for them, some students have said they just wanted the socialization of the in-person, and some families felt that their students would learn better that way. We also, as we began to look at our numbers and the way our buildings are laid out, determined that some foundational grade levels like preschool and first grade would have the opportunity to spread out a little more. Um, some of our gyms and libraries have been converted to classrooms so that preschool and first graders, if their parents choose, can attend actually Monday through Thursday in person if they would like to do that. And when it comes to new, and this year has been full of new adjustments, how have students work to kind of adjust to, to the new changes and how have they worked? Well, we offered families the opportunity to say, yes, we want to attend in person as far as hybrid goes once that started, but with the caveat that at any time, if you decide you want to make a change, you can. And we have seen a little fluctuation since the beginning of school. Some students came back and decided that, you know, wearing a mask all day long except for eating and outside mass breaks, et cetera, was a little difficult for them. Or that they actually had felt more successful than they thought with the virtual learning model. So we have had some students to go back to virtual learning. We've had some students decide after it's all started that yes, they do want to return to that in-person learning. So there've been some changes in that respect for students and that is fluid. Students can change their mind and adjust their schedules as they need to. Um, as you know, we have had some cases of coronavirus come into our schools. Thankfully, we have not experienced any school spread at this point, but there are times that if a group of students or staff members have been exposed, that everyone's asked to return to virtual learning. So we have had some of that as well. Um, certainly the difference, if you're an in-person learner, you're with that teacher in the classroom. And if you're a virtual learner now, whether it's just those few days a week or if it's five days a week, you have the opportunity to, in real time, engage with class more. When we were all virtual all the time, there were a lot more recorded class sessions because we know that not everyone has the internet, for example, but also that virtual schedule was a little more flexible. Now students are um, if you're in calculus, for example, it might be better for you to tune in live if the teacher's going over a new concept with in-person students so that you can watch that and ask questions as well, but the recordings are also available. So if there's a student who's learning virtually on a particular day and they can't tune in live, they can still certainly go back and watch those videos. You mentioned that there have been some cases in the school division. So another thing that goes along with that is a lot of individuals want to know exactly who it was, not just the grade level or the school. So what kind of measures prevent that, but also um, how have you guys uh, been dealing, I, I guess, with the cases uh, in the schools? 
Well, certainly anyone who works in the medical profession knows that HIPAA laws and regulations prevent us from sharing certain medical information with the public or with members of a classroom, for example. Um, also, student privacy regulations require that we maintain privacy for our students as much as is possible, as well as our staff members. Um, so, when a case is identified in a school, we do make sure that anyone who was exposed or potentially exposed is part of contact tracing. So, for example, if a student comes in and reports that he or she has tested positive or a staff member calls in and says that he or she has tested positive, we do make sure that we alert the staff members through a letter and in that letter we remind them of appropriate practices such as mask wearing, hand washing, remaining as far apart as possible, as often as possible. Um, and we have encouraged our staff members, rather than having large faculty meetings, for example, they do that via Zoom call. When they're in the classroom with their students, if you go into any classroom, our students can share with you that furniture's been moved towards the walls and things are separated much more than they ever would have been in the past to make sure that distancing is appropriate for our staff members and our students. So that message goes out to staff members to let them know that someone has tested positive. Certainly we can't share who that person is. But if someone in our school community, staff or student, has been exposed to someone who tested positive, they receive a phone call. And that's through contact tracing, typically with our school nurses, but sometimes with our school nurse coordinator. And that's all done in conjunction with the Department of Health. Again, if you receive that phone call, for privacy reasons, you're not told who you are exposed to, just that you've been exposed to someone who has tested positive. Anyone who receives that call should quarantine. And it's important to note that that quarantine doesn't just mean don't come to school. It means stay home all the whole 14 days. Don't go to the store, don't go to restaurants, don't go to church, quarantine, stay home. Um, certainly anyone who tests positive should isolate and stay away from everyone as much as they possibly can as well. Um, so that phone call goes out, but then we also notify all families in a school building. And so our staff members essentially get two letters because they also get a copy of the letter that we send to the whole school to let families know that a member of our school community has tested positive. Again, we can't share the name of that person, but certainly if a grade level, for example, needs to learn virtually, or if the whole school, for example, needs to go virtual for a few weeks, while people are in quarantine, we make sure that families are aware of that, either through phone call or through letter. But that letter that goes to families, if someone in their school has tested positive, just reminds people of those protocols. Again, check yourself for symptoms every single day. Stay home if you have any symptoms of any illness, not just a fever, because we know that um, if you have COVID, you don't always have a fever, or that's not always the first symptom that presents. So any symptom, you should stay home. Um, certainly, I know in the past, parents have been very concerned about attendance in our schools and their students' attendance impacting grades. This is obviously a very different time for attendance. And so if a student presents with any symptoms of illness, all their parent needs to do is call the school and say, Luis has a fever this morning and he's going to be learning virtually today. And the principal certainly is happy to accommodate that. So attendance is not as great um, a concern that parents should have at this time especially because we know that we are all trying to keep each other safe and that's one way we can do that is to make sure that we stay home if we're sick. Additionally, we have a lot of safety measures in place in our schools, a lot of mitigation strategies. Um, one of the things that we have done is to regularly and continually speak with our colleagues at the Department of Health and at the CDC to ensure that all of our practices are in compliance with their updated information because as you know, that information does change the more we learn about coronavirus. Um, it used to be acceptable to say that someone is not considered an exposure if they had not been around someone else in an enclosed space for six feet or less without a mask for 15 minutes. Now that's a little different. Now it's 15 minutes through the course of an entire day. So if we have an encounter for five minutes in the morning and then we see each other later in the day, those minutes add up through the course of the day, whereas before that wasn't the exact guidance. 
So our school nurse coordinator and the team of school nurses that we have are working very closely with the Department of Health to make sure that they are constantly making sure that every school building is practicing the most up-to-date protocol for everything that we need to do. So for our students, that means when they get off the bus or when they get out of the car in the morning, they have a temperature check. When I visit a school building, I have a temperature check. We aren't welcoming outside visitors right now simply because we don't want them to be exposed to anything, but also that's an additional person who may expose our students and staff to something. So for now, students and staff members of the school division are the only people who come into the school building for the most part. Um, but everyone who enters has a temperature check. We encourage everyone to do that at home as well, and of course not come to school if they have a temperature, but those, the extra safety measure is there. Um, we also, at our schools, if I go to a school, for example, the front office greeter asks me if I have any of the symptoms on the list of COVID symptoms. And if I say yes to any of those, I'll be asked to wait and come back to school later. That's another step that we have in place to make sure that our students and staff members are protected. Everyone wears a mask everywhere they go in the school. Um, obviously, students don't wear masks while they're eating. And if we're outside and able to spread apart, then they can also take a mask break. We do know from the guidance that we have received that wearing masks when you're in an enclosed space together is one of the best ways to make sure that we keep each other safe. So we are encouraging that and the mask should fit over the mouth and nose at all times. So um, we did notice in the first few weeks of school that that was a learning curve, especially for some of our younger learners. That's a, it feels like a really long period of time to wear a mask. So it was something that a lot of students had to get used to. A lot of our teachers had to get used to because we don't wear a mask all the time when we're at home or especially if we're outside. So that was something that was a bit of an adjustment. But just like in those first few weeks of school, we talk about the proper way to walk down the hall or to um, discuss something in class, maybe by raising our hand. We also talked about the protocol for wearing a mask and the importance of that. Certainly there's not discipline tied to mask wearing or non-mask wearing. Um, a student would never be suspended, for example, for not wearing their mask, but they may have a conversation with the principal if they're refusing to wear a mask. That might be a conversation between them and their parent and the principal. If a student's not able to wear a mask, we do recommend that they learn virtually just because we want them to be comfortable. In addition to that, there are lots of hand sanitizer stations around our schools, and hand sanitizer has always been encouraged in our schools because of lots of other viruses as well. But students are using hand sanitizer on a regular basis. Our hallways are marked with distancing dots is what the students are calling them, six feet apart, so that students know how far that actually is. Because it's hard to think about that when you're walking through the hallway, for example. A lot of our teachers have also marked in their classrooms that distance so that if students are lining up at the door or just so they know as they move around the room, they know what that distance is and how that space should look. Um, additionally, we also have barriers put up or plexiglass in some classrooms to make sure that if a teacher is working closely with students in a small group setting or in a one-on-one -on -one setting is what's typical, then they have that plexiglass between them to give them an added layer of protection. Thank you very much for that, Monica. We're going to be right back after this short break. We now return to the special edition of BCW 21 News. Again, I'm joined with Monica Hatchett of Henry County Public Schools, and we've been discussing COVID-19 in schools and what safety measures are in place. So another big question that parents have is, when there's a case, why isn't the entire school division shut down or goes virtual? So how do you all determine when an entire grade level or school goes, in, um, you know, goes to virtual? So the hardest and best answer is it depends. Um, certainly we look at each individual case because they are different and we try to determine first is that case related to school or does the person know that they contracted COVID outside of school. 
So far, all of our cases have been reported as community spread or outside of school, not school transmission, which is important to us because it lets us know that our mitigation strategies, the things that we're doing, are working and are helping because there are people who are asymptomatic that we don't know even have it. So that is a plus for us. Um, but when we find out that someone has the virus, thankfully it is typically reported to us very quickly and we appreciate staff members and parents doing that on behalf of their students. Once we know that, in contact tracing, we can determine who that student or staff member was exposed to. So if a staff member has been exposed to a classroom full of students for a period of a day, for example, then they may all need to quarantine. And so that may mean, for example, if it's A day students who were exposed, the B day students will either have a substitute teacher or they may also all learn virtually for the period of the teacher's quarantine. Typically, that is determined based on how many substitutes we have available and across the division, how many substitutes we need on a daily basis. So for example, you know Meadowview Elementary School did not come back to in-person learning on October 12th because they had an extensive number of staff members who had to quarantine. Um, some of them were related to exposure to positive cases at our school. None of them actually tested positive afterward, thankfully. However, some of them were not related to positive cases in the school, but they've been exposed in the community, so they had to quarantine as well. Because we had a number of staff members who had to be out, we did not feel that we could sufficiently staff every classroom the way it needed to be staffed, and our number of substitutes available was not adequate for making sure that students would have the high quality instruction that we expect in person every single day. So it was decided that Meadowview would remain virtual for two additional weeks, and now they're back to in-person learning. Um, certainly, we've had other cases where a classroom might close or go virtual, for example. If we have a substitute who's able to come in, then the substitute will take the place of the classroom teacher as much as possible in person. Um, for example, at one of our middle schools, we had a grade level that was exposed to a positive student. And um, each middle school operates grade levels within teams, so small cohorts. And that group of teachers had been exposed to a positive case, so it was determined that their team would learn virtually for a period of time. We did not have to close down the whole grade level because only that team was exposed. And certainly, since only the team was exposed, we didn't need to close the whole school because we were able to do virtual learning with them, acquire substitutes for in-person learners who needed to be able to do that. So it is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Certainly, um, we do continue to look at community spread. I know that the question about when would the whole division close is one that's ever present on a lot of people' mind, a lot of people's minds. It's ever present on our minds as well. Um, we do see, and I know our county administrator and other people in our town have talked a lot about the fact that we seem to be relaxing a little lately. Um, we see a lot of families having large gatherings again. We see um, people having special events, parties, for example, and then, and, and that's across the nation, not just in Henry County, but then we see groups of people coming down with the virus after an event like that. And so for us, continuing to educate our students to protect themselves if they do determine that it's appropriate to participate in an event like that, but ultimately to stay away from events like that, to make sure that um, our community does not see widespread impact. If we got to the point that our community saw such a widespread impact that it was necessary to close more than one school or a portion of our schools, it might be time at that point to determine, yes, it is most appropriate because we don't have enough substitutes, because we have so many positive cases in our community that impacts our schools, that we do need to close our schools for a period of time. So that is something that we look at on a regular basis and um, our superintendent takes very seriously as she talks on a daily basis and not just once a day, but regularly throughout the course of every day with our local experts as well as our health coordinators here in the school division and across the state.
Now for one of the tough questions, because of course those have to be asked, and with going along with transparency, a lot of individuals and members of the community ask the question of why they are not notified every single time there's a case in every single school, even though it might not affect them directly. Certainly we understand the community's concern for the virus and the desire to want to know every single time a case arises. Um, our guidance from the state has been that we inform the impacted or affected classrooms, school, families, etc. So to date we have not shared with the community as a whole every single time there's a case because we have approached the families and the school community that has been most impacted. However, it is something that's important to us and so we have discussed a lot how we best do that for the community so and keep it in a central place so that people have it easily for reference and so on. Um, one of the things that we've talked a lot about and that our colleagues around the country have begun to do is to have a dashboard of sorts and the state has a dashboard and you can go there and see a limited amount of information but for our community as a whole and we feel that that transparency is critical so we are working to launch a dashboard on our website so that families can go to that Henry County Schools COVID-19 area of our website at any time and look at the amount of cases in our community, the number of people on quarantine, for example. And it is important to look at that information to know the impact that the virus is having, not just on Henry County as a whole, but on our school division. So that is something that we're working on. Certainly there is some background work that has to happen as far as website development goes, but we hope to be able to launch that very soon. So we've discussed a lot during this interview in questions may still arise. So how do members of the community, parents, and even students get questions answered if they still have them? Certainly we don't want anyone to have questions. We want to answer those. We don't want anyone to have a concern and not have that addressed or to have misinformation. So we want to answer those questions for people. We want you to call. We want you to share information or questions or concerns through the feedback tab on our website. Meet us on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and we respond to those questions as quickly as we possibly can. Send an email. Um, you're certainly also welcome to come by our central office if you have questions and you want to speak with someone in person. But it is definitely something that we feel is critical that we answer those questions. And there are no questions that are too great or too small in this case. This is something new and different for everyone. And we understand that the community has concerns. Students, staff, parents, or people who are completely unrelated to the school division. We want everyone to feel comfortable with the way our students are learning and growing in Henry County Public Schools. And so we do ask that if you have a question, please make sure that you let us know. Talk with someone that you feel close with or reach out to us anonymously even through our website so that we can make sure that we're sharing the information we need to share. Now certainly, we can't share the name of someone who's a positive case. In most cases, most of us don't even know who that person is because we're not allowed to know either. Um, because again, we're protecting the privacy of patients and of our students. But as much information as we can possibly give someone who inquires, we want to be able to do that. So again, I want to thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to us and um, answer some of those tough questions that students, parents, or community members may have. And again, um, just telling everyone that student safety is top priority for Henry County Public Schools. So thank you again. Thank you.